From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Hello, marketers, and welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Okay. Today, we're going to finish our discussion centered around reaching B2B customers. In our last episode, Doug Bell, the VP of Marketing from our sponsor, Searchmetrics, walked us through how he combined his previous experience in finance with his understanding of brand marketing, how he's developed his customer segmentation at Searchmetrics, and how he matches the right customers with the right products. If you missed that last episode, I highly recommend that you go back and give it a listen. That said, in today's episode, the second part of our conversation with Doug, he's going to talk us through his approach to reaching B2B prospects, the relationship between sales and marketing, and the difference between marketing a business-to-business and a business-to-consumer company. Here's the second part of our interview with Doug Bell from Searchmetrics. How do you reach people that are at businesses as opposed to going to consumer? Tell me about your marketing mix. How do you think about reaching your prospects and what's the process there? I think the best way to think about this is to think, am I in a recognized software category as a starting place? Is there a neat space that you fit into? And in our case, it's enterprise SEO software. So yes, that category exists. So how do I fit within that scope and sphere? Am I well-regarded? Is my brand well-regarded? Am I likely to be in each deal cycle? And then from there, you're thinking, how do I get into more deal cycles? And that's, I think, the simple first exercise. Then the next is your buyer personas. And if you don't have buyer personas, get them right away. It's been a standard part of how marketing operates. 10 years ago, it was brand new. But most of us have a way of digesting our segments and our buyers through buyer personas. And then what you're doing is you're taking a look and you're saying, what matters to them? And where are they in the sales cycle? Making sure that you have ways of reaching buyers when they're out there looking based on your channel mix. And you're not trying to reach out to an executive buyer to teach them something when they're simply going to sign off on something. Talk to me about what you view as the relationship between brand marketers, let's call it growth marketing or customer acquisition, and then sales. Where's the line in the sand? That's a handoff point typically, Ben, from the moment that the salesperson says, thank you for this lead. Thank you. I've got it from here. I'm signing off and I'm taking it. So the piece that usually is handled by marketing is the, how do I create recognition of my brand through a combination of different channels, content syndication, social media, trade shows, what have you. How do I make sure that when that occurs, either they're reaching out to me or I'm reaching out to them. And that whole process in and of itself will tend to determine your awareness and lead generation strategy. But there is a point where you hand off to sales where there is likely maybe one or two contacts and that opportunity is validated by sales. And at that point, sales then takes that life cycle the rest of the way through. Okay. So marketing's responsibility at a B2B company is to build awareness, right? Get somebody to understand what your company is and what your products are for, to reach out to them and to get them to engage with the sales team, which is what is called essentially moving somebody from being a prospect somebody that you want to have a relationship with to an opportunity, meaning someone that is engaging with the sales team. And when an opportunity has been created, essentially the marketing team sort of hands that off to sales and says, okay, go get them. As a marketer, you are responsible for driving revenue, but you're very much dependent on the sales team's ability to convert those opportunities into dollars. What are the KPIs that you look at to sort of understand your marketing team's success and then looking at how that is converted into revenue? So what I look at, 
and I think a lot of B2B marketing executives look at is what's the efficiency of my lead funnel? And what I tend to look at is what's the ratio of some important thing at the top of the funnel, I'm going to pick raw leads, in other words, leads that have not been evaluated. And then I'm going to look at the bottom of the funnel, which is customer wins, irrespective of the size of the customer win. And I'm going to divide those two numbers out. I'm going to get a ratio. And that's really always the key metric for me in terms of evaluating the health of the funnel. And the reason I do that, Ben, is because the more efficient that funnel is and the more I can pay attention on making that funnel efficient, the less investment it takes to generate that customer win. But that's really what I tend to look at is what's my efficiency level? And then I'm backing out from customer wins all the way back out to that first metric. In this case, I'm picking raw. It could be something higher up in the funnel. Depends on what's critical to your business in that moment. But I think, Ben, you were also asking for, how do I measure the handoff between marketing and sales? And that piece really tends to be very critical. And again, I'd say, going back to my original advice, don't be stopped by the efficiency of your sales organization or the handoff process. It's not your job to be the head of sales, nor is it your job to close business. But look at that piece of the business, because if it's inefficient, you're not going to be able to afford to feed that sales team. And there are ways to address that If you have an adversarial relationship with sales, all is lost because there's so much great information in there. But maybe let's just focus on that handoff piece for a bit. Really what's happening at that point is you're handing off a, could be a lead, and that handoff to sales, at that point, sales is saying, we agree, and that's an important element. We agree that this is something we can work with, and then sales takes that over. But the first metric I gave you, which is, in this case, I picked raw lead all the way down to customer win, That measures full funnel effectiveness and allows you fairly quickly to focus on what's important in terms of how that funnel is working. And usually what happens if it's not working and you may be handing off leads that aren't good. So define what a good lead is and make sure you're handing those off. Get rid of that ambiguity. The other thing could be, in fact, the market has shifted and there's change happening and your price point is wrong or you're positioned poorly or fill in the blank. And that's where I think that true marketing leader should perform best. It's in that ambiguity space where it's easy to point fingers. Don't do that. I think the other thing that we haven't talked about is what are the marketing channels? Talk to me about what the traditional B2B marketing mix is and what are some of the go-to channels for you? So the traditional mix, Ben, is a combination of your online presence. And that's usually a mix between your SEO and your PPC. Throw in there social media, which has moved from content promotion and syndication to a true lead generation channel over time. People are becoming more used to using social media to find future vendors. And those things are occurring really at the top of the funnel for you. So those are the three that I think are really important. Depending on whether you're in a category or not, in other words, you're in this defined space of other software providers, the trade show route, so sponsoring trade shows, having a booth, or having somebody speak at a trade show or both. That can also be an important factor as well. But those are the things that typically sit at the top of your funnel. Because the transaction amounts typically are higher in B2B SaaS, it's not always the case. But generally speaking, especially for B2B enterprise SaaS, they're bigger. Your customer set is much smaller. And this idea of broadcast media or advertising goes. That's for SAP. It's for these huge players, right? And even they, frankly, aren't doing much advertising. So that layer really is about your ability to get in front of prospects because either they're searching for something or, and I mentioned before, Ben, this idea of getting in front of them. And that's usually the sales development or the business development organization. And they're listening for moments, right? They're in their LinkedIn profiles. They're watching your behavior, not to creep you out too much, but if you hit our website, we see your behavior, especially when you come back to the website and we can choose to reach out to you. The sales development team can. And that's usually what's happening at the top of the funnel. There's your content, which you can syndicate through social media and what your online presence is. In some specific cases, when your category is broad enough, there are trade shows. And then there's also just having an understanding and being able to analyze what someone who interacts with any of your assets, how likely they are to convert. And that gets more into this sort of pipeline methodology. I think that there's a channel that we haven't talked about yet. You have a sales team. And in a traditional business to consumer, a B2C tool, there isn't a salesperson that's reaching out. There is a web page that you put your credit card in to buy a service or a widget. How does the sales team serve as a customer acquisition channel? Because I think that that's really important and the big difference between B2B and B2C. Let's split that out into two pieces. So there's the role of a sales organization to take an opportunity and guide that opportunity to the point that it becomes a customer. 
That in and of itself is a very specialized skill set. It is project management with traditional selling, along with problem management all together in one. And those are very highly compensated people, the salespeople that is, for a good reason, because that's tough to do. That's really hard to do. Then there's this other piece that says, and this is especially true as your average selling price goes up. Those salespeople can actually be a very effective lead generation mechanism for you. And the reason that can be very important is because the higher your price point, the more skilled your sales force tends to be, and the more capable they tend to be at getting out there and recognizing big deals for them. So if you're a B2B SaaS player that has a small price point, let's say 5K or 10K, you still have salespeople, don't have them out there looking for deals, right? That's a waste of their time. You should have a very large inbound machine that's constantly cranking through highly qualified leads and handing them over. I've worked for SaaS companies that had a roughly a 5 to 10K price point. You don't want them out there discovering deals. It's not worth it. But that's how those sales organizations function. They are ultimately the people that guide this fairly complex thing. So if you think about a business, one of your future customers, spending, let's say, $100,000 on your software per year, that sounds like an awfully big number, but it's not unusual for large enterprises. That could be career risking stuff for the person making the purchase. So you almost need a Zen psychologist slash project manager to manage that. That person also could be a very effective channel for you in terms of generating new interest in new business. So you're saying that you have these very specialized product manager, problem solver, salespeople, account execs that are great at walking a prospect through why the product and service is the right fit for them. But it seems like their job is primarily around closing as opposed to meeting and researching and creating new contacts. There is this, sometimes it's called business development or sales development layer that exists. And they should have two roles. One role is as inbound leads come in, they're hopping all over that, qualifying those leads, getting the information to the prospect they need up into the point that it makes sense to hand them off to this highly qualified account executive. The other piece is they should be out there listening in the market. Typically, LinkedIn is a really great source of this. They're listening and they're looking for buyer personas like the ones that you have and you organize around with marketing and products. And they're looking for opportunities to get in front of them. Cold calling is dead, by the way. This is usually email or social media activity. And they're getting in front of them. They're saying, you seem to be having a problem that my customers have and that we solve for them really well. How can I help you? So earlier when I spoke to this idea of a salesperson being able to get in front of a prospect, I was speaking to the SDR team or the BDR team. Essentially, the SDR, the sales development reps, are able to reach out broadly because their entire responsibility is around making contacts and vetting whether somebody is interested in the product or service. The account exec is big game hunting and looking for large strategic relationships that they can cultivate over a larger period of time. Is that fair? That's right. As the VP of marketing, what's the goal for you at this point in your career? I think for me, it really comes down to working at a place where I believe in the products and the people in the market. And I think it's taken me 10 years to understand this lesson. I spent a lot of time and frankly, I'm glad I spent that time looking for new opportunities and looking for broader scope of responsibility and being really kind of willing to make change in order to get that skill set. And I I value that time where I was trying to do as much as I could. And that included managing sales organizations or being the head of alliances and business development, not just marketing. I think that's an important part of any marketer's education. But it's ultimately me being in a place where I believe in what I'm selling and what I'm marketing. And I'm incredibly lucky to be at search metrics, not just because it's search metrics, but because it was such a great channel for me and such a great tool in my toolkit. I'm such a big believer in the power of creating really great content that connects with people that it makes those tougher days easier. So Ben, for me, it's always being at a place where I believe in the products and services. And if you don't have that, go find another job. (laughs) And there's a journey there certainly that says, you know, you don't have to believe in the products, you're building skill sets. But really for me at this point, that's where I want to land. One of the questions I ask you for the people that are relatively new in marketing, what lessons have you learned that you'd like to pass on? What advice do you have for new marketers that are early in their career as they're doing skill set development? Get experience across the entire funnel in whatever capacity that you can. You don't need to be an expert in each layer, not by any means. But if you can move from email marketing and nurturing to being a digital marketer, in other words, being responsible for CPC and SEO, you can spend some time working on the trade show circuits. 
heck, can you be an account executive for a while? These are hard jobs and high pressure jobs, but it's really worth it. And I think that my experience in sales, you know, I fully understood much better the crud (laughs) that quite often was being handed to me by marketing and the stuff that I was dealing with from products and how at the end of the day, there was no excuse. I had to deal with that stuff. And that helped me really profoundly understand how to hand better stuff off to sales and what to prioritize. The other thing I'd say is, this is a long game, marketing and marketing leadership. So don't get too hung up when things are going poorly and don't get too excited when things are going well. That's just a part of the game, ultimately. Maybe that's just good advice in life. So the other piece I'd say, maybe boiling that down more to the topic today, Ben, is there is a goal for you that's been agreed to by your boss, your CEO, and the board. Typically, that goal is growth. Don't let anything distract you from that goal. There are times when people are going to say, hey, we need better t-shirts, which as a kind of a strategic thinking, you know, numbers-driven marketer, that absolutely drives me bonkers. But there are times when you got to produce really great t-shirts, but don't let the production of t-shirts or the production of collateral be the thing that drives you. How are you helping each and every day driving towards that larger strategic role, which is typically growth? Stay focused on that. So before I let you go, anyone you're looking to meet, anything that you're trying to promote, feel free to give me whatever plug and how can people who are interested in you or search metrics get in touch? Well, you can always hit the website and request a contact or ask to see the product if that's what you're interested in. I would highly encourage it. I obviously have drunk the Kool-Aid as you speak, but we unequivocally have the best products and services in the marketplace. And a big part of my job is making sure the US market knows that because the European market already understands that. But the other thing I'd say is this, I'm always looking for people with different perspectives. And that place that I'm in right now, and we know this from working together, Ben, for a while, is this idea of how social media can help at the top of the funnel beyond the traditional content syndication. And if you have ideas there and understand that a bit better, I would love to hear more about it. I have my people I've worked with for years who are experts in social media, but I'm always fascinated to hear more in that area. Great. Doug, I really appreciate you joining us on the podcast. And if anybody wants to reach out to Doug, you can go to searchmetrics.com and get in touch with them that way. Well, this is the best podcast you've ever had, right, Ben? Well, as one of our sponsors, you're always going to be our favorite. <laughs> ben, I appreciate the time. I really enjoyed it. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks again to our guest, Doug Bell from Searchmetrics for joining us. If you'd like to read the transcript of this podcast, we've published it on martechpod.com. And if you're a subscriber to the podcast, we'd like to stop and say thank you. We want you to feel like a member of our community. So if you have questions, comments, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, feel free to reach out to me directly at podcast at benjshap.com. You can also reach us on LinkedIn or Twitter at LLC. If you haven't subscribed yet and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we've got some great episodes lined up for you in the next few weeks. Okay, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. 